Hallelujah. Praise God. What a God we serve, a mighty God. Welcome everyone to another time in the presence of the Lord. We give God praise for the privilege of being able to come together in tonight's liberation service. The Lord is good. His mercies endures forever. He's a great God and we just worship Him. I'd like us to take a few minutes to just appreciate God in the place of prayer and just thank Him and love on Him this evening for His faithfulness in our lives, for His grace, for His mind, for His love towards us. Let's lift our voice, everyone, wherever you are, and just begin to bless the name of the Lord. Father, we give you praise. Father, we give you glory. Father, we worship you. Asian of days. Likoto bashata labadiada do shakapa. King of kings and Lord of lords, the mighty God, the great I am, the God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can ask or think, according to his power that works in us. We give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor. We give you all the thanks. We give you adoration, Lord. We worship you. We adore you, our King. We adore you, Jehovah. Ragoto barasataya labasha. Mentolo brosotolaba. Heaven and earth adore you. Angels bow before you. What a glorious God we serve. What a mighty God we serve. We worship you, our King. We praise you. We lift you on high. You are the name above all names. You are Jesus. And beside you there is no other. We appreciate you. We come before you in total surrender. In total surrender this evening. Blessed be God from whom all blessings flows, from whom all grace flows, from whom all favor flows. He's the King of kings. He's the Lord of laws. He's the mighty God. He's the great I am. We worship him today. We praise him today. Come on, give him praise. Don't ask for anything. Just worship him. Just adore him. Just give him thanks. Just give him worship. Give him adoration. Lift him higher. Lift him higher. Jesus, we worship you. Jesus, we lift you higher. Jesus, we exalt you. Jesus, we magnify you. Jesus, we give you praise. Era koto barazo ziata, era kata balabaya, reshoto baraze klotosha, reketi balada bababasha, era zozo brada kaba ye kataba, eri kato zavalaba. Mandele broso toa ish kabaroto shiedeba. Give him praise, give him praise, give him praise. Give him all the glory, give him all the honor, give him all adoration. We worship you, we worship you. I don't want you to ask for anything, I just want you to bless his name. Just bless his name. Just magnify his name. Just glorify his name. Just extol him. Just give him praise. Just give him glory. Just give him honor. Just give him thanks. He is worthy to be praised. He is worthy to be exalted. He is worthy to be lifted. He is worthy. He is worthy. Aragoto baladabaha. Rishatala bababaha. Ragadabadiataba, Lazo Koto Baradaba, Eshalabadia Kotosa, Razozo Velika Para, Raje Galabadasha, Likotos Alabrate, Legadibaladabo Shate, Escobrado Comanamaha, Raze Galabashadabadabayaha, E Razozo Bradakaba, Lefiato Zibiata, Eshaka Razoziata, Lebrocoto Baladabashata, Inda. 
Kalosa de Ragotoba, Era Gotobiate, Escarazoziata, Ragoto Barata. I feel the power of God. Era Gotua Labasa, Leketila Babashate, Ezobra de Kamananusa, Endulege Bananamandu City, Efirio Sopala, Razozole Klato Shata, Rege Baba Babora Namanama, Era Soso, Brande Bashata, Rezuzu Brakataba, Revelutu Shadaba. We bless your name, Jesus. Oh, mighty God. Woo. Sharagato Sapa. Mendu Seviria Bosotosha. Blessed be your name. Glory to your name. We exalt you, our King. In Jesus' most precious name. And every child of God, let me hear your amen. <laughs> Come on, shout the loud amen. Glory to God, you are welcome again to the presence of the Lord. In the presence of God, there is fullness of joy. At his right hand, there are pledges forevermore. Glory to God in the highest. What a joy to have you in tonight's liberation service. I want to encourage that you take a minute to share tonight's broadcast on your Facebook page. I've already done that. And I want to ask the rest of you to do that right now. Uh, you can copy the YouTube link and just send out. Uh, particularly also to friends. But also in the WhatsApp groups that you are part of. Especially the FMC WhatsApp group. Women ministry, men's ministry, workers. Uh, just all the platforms that you are part of. And just prompt people to let them know that liberation service has begun. One of the challenges that uh, some people have, especially with the uh, lockdown situation, is that because there's so much time available to people at home, for those who are not really that busy, sometimes uh, they forget what is the next thing to happen because the, the brain or the body is not as active as it would usually be. So let's help each other. And it's part of the things that accounts for when you listen to the news, you are told that depression is on the rise and all of that because people are not as active as they would usually be. And uh, like you know, any, any system that you don't, you, you don't use regularly becomes dormant. So people's brains are not you know, being as active as it should be. So that's why prompting people, getting them in for things like this is important, you know, to just to help encourage and keep somebody going. All right, so let's all do that. And uh, we will be kicking off our studies. I'd like to begin, you know, by asking, you know, how was your week? I know I can't see you physically, but you can send me the comments which I can see. I hope you've had a blessed week so far. I hope, you know, you are, um, you know, meditating and growing and just, you know, uh, basking in the word that God sent us on Sunday, which is beauty for ashes. And I pray that the blessings of God is upon you. I pray that your week has been blessed so far, that you are in health mentally, you are in health, you know, physically, uh, you are in health spiritually and in all areas of your life. And I pray that God continues to strengthen you, strengthen your family, and all around you. In Jesus' most precious name, amen and amen. God is faithful. All right, today we are, uh, as we continue, you know, as you know, I think we began this January last year, 2020, our studies in Acts. Today we are beginning chapter 12, because we concluded chapter 11 last week. We're looking at Acts chapter 12 from verse 1 to verse 5. Acts chapter 12 from verse 1 all the way down to verse 5. And we're going to be discussing this uh, under the topic King Herod 
Agrippa, Agrippa 1. Take note, King Herod, Agrippa 1, kills James and locks up Peter. Um, now, when we say King Herod, sometimes we think, oh, you know, Herod is a name. Herod is part of the title. It's like saying King of England. Yeah? King of England or Queen of England, Elizabeth II. Is that okay? So, we are studying King Herod, Agrippa I, kills James, and locks up Peter. It's important I mention that because we will, at some point, be, uh, maybe not today, um, but at some point, be looking at the different Herods. Yeah? So that's why that statement I just made now is very key. So today we're looking at King Herod, Agrippa I, kills James, and locks up Peter. King Herod, Agrippa I, kills James, and locks up Peter. Introduction, good evening, saints. Welcome to tonight's liberation service. In this year of pleasant surprises, whatever God has not planted in your life is uprooted now and forever in Jesus' name. Is somebody receiving that with an amen? Everything that God has not planted in your life is what? Is uprooted. Is uprooted. Is uprooted. I don't care what it is. It does not matter how long it's been there. My God didn't plant it. It can't stay. My God didn't plant it. It cannot stay. And I want you to declare right now. And, and you know, cons think of that thing that is in your life that should not be there. And say to it, my God didn't plant you, you can't stay. My God didn't plant you, you can't stay. You are uprooted now out of my life. I speak that over somebody's life in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Matthew chapter 15, verse 13. I want to read that uh, as it speaks very loud and clear about this decree. It said, but he answered and said, every plant which my heavenly father has not planted will be uprooted. Not will be trimmed. It's not going to be trimmed. It's going to be uprooted. So from your life, it is uprooted now. You receive it. Let me hear your loud amen. Your ashes is replaced with beauty. Is replaced with beauty. Your ashes is replaced with beauty. The life of ashes is now replaced with beauty. In the name of Jesus Christ. So in today's liberation service, we will continue our studies in Acts. As I said, we're looking at Acts chapter 12. Verse 1 to 5, may the word of the Lord liberate each and every one under the sound of my voice. In Jesus' most precious name, and everyone say, Amen and Amen. Now, let's read Acts chapter 12, verse 1 to verse 5. Acts 12, 1 to 5. The Bible says, now, about that time, Herod the king, Stretch out his hand to harass some from the church. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to seize Peter also. Now it was during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So when he had arrested him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four squads of soldiers to keep him, intending to bring him before the people after Passover. Verse 5. Peter was therefore kept in prison, but constant prayer was offered to God for him by 
the church. Interesting read, instructive read, uh, and we believe that God will be speaking to us very expressly from that verse today. Now you remember uh, where we wrapped up last week. Uh, it was when Agabus had told the church by the spirit of prophecy that there will be famine around the world. And, uh, you know, we had uh, uh, Barnabas and uh, Saul who were given items by the church in Antioch to support the brethren and the church in Judea, which was the headquarter church. Now, the Bible begins in verse 12, no, in chapter 12, saying, now, about that time, around that same period, the, about that time, Herod, the king, stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. To harass some from the church. We'll be discussing these five verses on the first subhead. First subhead, we'll be looking at why King Herod Agrippa I was after the early church. Why was he after the early church? With focus on the top men. Why was he after the early church? And why was his focus in attacking the early church on the top men of the church? Now, the reason is exactly the same as what lies behind the persecution of the church today. Many of you are under the sound of my voice will agree or you are probably aware that across many nations in the world, the church faces persecution. There are places where the church of Jesus Christ is under severe persecution. And you ask yourself, why? Why are they persecuting the church? Why is the church under persecution? And that's the question we're asking ourselves. Why is Agrippa one? Herod Agrippa one? You know, why is he after the early church? And why is his focus on the top men? We want to answer those two. Why was he after the early church? And why is his focus under the top men? But I, I began by saying that the reason is no different from the reason that lies behind the persecution even of the church today. The church of Jesus Christ today. Uh, I continue with our outline. Hatred of the gospel and the God behind it. Yeah? Who they see as a rival or danger to their interests. Why do you think Herod was after the church? It is because of a hatred for the gospel. And the hatred for the God that is behind the gospel. Because they see him as a rival or a danger to their interests. And it's the same thing today. Why do you think that the world, the gov some governments, you know, some leaders, some individuals are against the church? It is because they hate the gospel. They hate what the gospel brings, what the gospel says. And they see it as a danger to their interest. And when you look at some of those interests around the world, promoted by governments, promoted by presidents of nations, promoted by certain society, they are anti the gospel. So they feel that the gospel is against this interest. And as such, the church must be persecuted. So this is one of the primary reasons why King Herod Agrippa I rose against this church. This is well illustrated, our outline says, by the account of King Herod Agrippa I, who eventually lost his life, as you would see, you know, as recounted in Acts chapter 12, verse 20 to 23. Why? The man would have men worship him rather than acknowledge the true God. Let's look at Acts chapter 12, verse 20 to 23. So you, you'll be able to grasp, you know, 
uh, Agrippa's own because he was anti the gospel. He was persecuted just because to him, the 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 gospel and the God behind it is a is a rival to him and against his interest. It's like a danger to his interest. And what was Herod's Agrippa one's interest? We we'll see it here in Acts chapter twelve, verse twenty to twenty three. He said, "Now Herod." had been very angry with the people of Ty and Sidon, but they came to him with one accord, and having made Blastos, the king's personal aide, their friend, they asked for peace because their country was supplied with food by the king's country. Yeah, look at verse 21. So on a set day, Herod arrayed in royal apparel. Listen to this because you'll get why Herod was, you know, his own interest. Herod was arrayed in royal apparel, sat on his throne, and gave an oration to them. Verse 22. And the people kept shouting, the voice of a God and not of a man. So they were hailing Herod. Verse 23. He said, then immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give glory to God and he was eaten by worms and what and died can you see that so you will notice there that herod this guy he, he wanted worship and so if the people are worshiping god they cannot worship him if their praise is to god they cannot praise him so it to him the gospel and the god behind it was a rival to him and was a danger to his interest. That was the reason oh, that Herod, you know, began to attack and persecute the church. Every time you see a person rise up to persecute the church, you see a government of a nation promoting laws that are against the church or persecution is, is and, and, and tightening. If you don't do this, we shut it down. If you don't do this, we do this. It is because they have an interest, an ulterior. They may camouflage it in saying, you know, is human right, is equal opportunity, is this. My dear, many a time, there is a hidden agenda. There's an ulterior motive against the church and they feel that the greatest opposition to that ulterior motive is the gospel and the God behind it. So this is the reason why Herod was against the church. So to cut out this, to cut out this rivalry between the true God and himself, because the guy felt that he was competing with God. You can imagine a mere man. He, he felt he, God was his rival. Uh, uh, rival. He, was, uh, he was having a rivalry with God. That's what he thought. So to cut out this rivalry between the true God and himself, he sought to silence the church. He, he sought to silence the church. So he therefore reasoned within himself that what is a, what a better way to do that than by killing off the leaders. So he felt, okay, to silence the church, there is no better way for me to do that than to kill off the leaders. If I kill off the leaders, then I'll be able to silence the church. So that's why he targeted the top men, the leaders. That way, so he felt, what's a better way than, to, than killing off the leaders? That way, the followers would disperse, they would scatter, the church would come to an end, and I will be the undisputed Lord and master over Judah. This is what was going on in Herod Agrippa one's head. With no rivals from any quarter. So what did he do? The Bible said, so he killed Apostle James. You see why the man killed Apostle James? He killed Apostle James, the brother of Apostle John. You can see that in Acts chapter 12 verse 3. When he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, after he killed James, and he saw that the people celebrated him, yes, and they approve of it. Remember that these Jewish guys were like the Sahendrin, anyway, who were against the believers. Now they have a king who wants worship, 
who is attacking each other. So they would rather that their, their, the, the believers are killed by a, a, an unbeliever, Herod, than for their own religious, uh, uh, to, pro, to, to protect their religious uh, 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 state. So you, you find that even in the church, you know, where uh, uh, governments rise up against the church or people, and you have some people who claim to, to be believers, uh, but they are just religious, in quote, and they side with us and say, yes, this and that, and they support those persecuting policies. That's what these Jewish people. So when Aaron saw, as we, as we see there, he said when he saw that this met with approval among the Jews, what did he do? He proceeded to seize Peter also. This happened during the festival of unleavened bread. So in one bread, we can see why Herod Agrippa I was after the early church. Was after because he felt that his interest was threatened by the gospel. And what was his interest? The man wanted to be worshipped. He wanted to be praised. And why did he target the top men? He targeted the top men because he felt, if I can kill off the leaders, the followers will disperse. And that would be the end of the church. And that's exactly what he began to do. So he took James. They killed James. The people rejoiced. You know, the religious Jews rejoiced because they felt, hmm, these people that we have been trying to shut down since Acts chapter 2, that they should not talk about this Jesus. Somebody is helping us now to kill them. And then he went to take Peter, preparing also to kill him. Subhead number two. How he ensured Peter could not escape during the Passover week. Before I begin to discuss, you know, uh, the subhead number two, I want to decree, pass a decree, that the Lord will silence all those who have positioned themselves to persecute his church. They are silenced now in the name of Jesus. I want to pray also for everyone under the sound of my voice who is suffering one persecution or the other, or suffering one thing or the other, just because of your faith, just because you chose to be a child of God. I pray today that you are delivered from such persecution. The grace of God be available to you. That the weapons of the enemy that have been stationed against you be nullified, destroyed, scattered from your life completely now in the name of Jesus Christ. If you receive that decree, let me hear your amen. Glory to God. So, subhead number two, how... Herod ensured Peter could not escape during the Passover week. So when he has captured Peter, how did he ensure that this guy will not es escape? Because if Peter was brought in during the festival of unleavened bread. So how did he ensure that he will not escape? Now, outline says the Passover night, which is usually Thursday sundown, so Thursday evening when the sun comes down. Yeah, that's when the Passover night begins. To Friday sundown. So it's a 24-hour window. So you can look at it, uh, say, from 6 p.m. on Thursday evening to 6 p.m. on Friday evening is what is considered the Passover. The what? The Passover. The Passover night. So Thursday sundown. To Friday sundown was the Passover. Yeah? And we want to try and understand the feast. And, you know, how did he ensure that this guy, Peter, that he has now arrested, does not escape during the feast? So the Passover night, Thursday sundown to Friday sundown, was followed by seven days of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So the Feast of Unleavened Bread, starting from sundown of Friday 
to sundown on the next Friday. So I want you to understand this. So this feast, they follow each other. In other words, Passover starts on a Thursday evening when the sun goes down. Thursday evening to the next day, Friday evening. Yeah, that's Passover. Then immediately Passover ends, which is Friday evening. Then you have what is called the Feast of Unleaving Bread, which takes off just as Passover is ended. So it's almost like a continuation. Are you, are you getting it? A continuation. Why one is one day or a, a period of 24 hours, the Feast of Unleaving Bread is a seven-day feast. So Thursday evening to Friday, uh, Friday evening, the next day, Passover, and then from that Friday evening to the following week, Friday, is the Feast of Unleaving Bread. So that's what now? That's eight days. Yeah? This was effectively eight days of public holidays. Some people are smiling. I'm sure they would like an eight days uh, bank holiday. I know some people would like that. You know? Uh, so, effectively, eight days of public holiday for various religious observances in the temple. So, this was what was going on. This included celebration of the feast of first fruits. So, it was in this period they would also do a celebration of the feast of first fruits, which they kept from sundown on the very Saturday after the Passover night. So, in, in, in the midst of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, uh, the Saturday of it is uh, the, the, there's the feast or the celebration of the Feast of First Fruit. So, which uh, on that very Saturday, after the Passover night celebration, to the very next day, i.e. Sunday sundown. So, the whole eight-day season was called the Feast of of unleavened bread or just Passover. Are you, are you getting that? So the whole eight days, a lot of things happening in between is called the Feast of Unleavened Bread or the Feast of Passover. You find that in Luke chapter 22, verse 1, and then obviously Acts chapter 12, verse 1 that we read earlier. But let's look at Luke, Luke 22, verse 1. Luke 22 verse 1 say, Now the feast of unleavened bread drew near, which is called Passover. Are you seeing there? So is that a called feast of unleavened bread or you call it Passover? That's what those eight days is referred to. And in our primary text, Acts chapter 12 verse 1, uh, uh, the Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched out his hand to harass some from the church. Yeah, he said, let me uh, uh, read a bit for that. Then he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw that he pleased the Jews, he proceeded for that to seize Peter also. Now it was during the days of unleavened bread. The days of unleavened bread, which is the eight days. So that's the period. I hope you get that now. With the, I hope I've explained it enough for you to be able to grab and, and paint the picture. So Herod and his supporters chose to wait until the feast of unleavened bread was over before killing Peter. So because he was arrested during the feast of unleavened bread, they can't kill him during that feast. He wanted to wait until the feast is over before they now eventually kill him. Are you getting that? So, this is what accounted for why Peter was locked up in prison. This is what accounted for why he was locked up in prison. Because he can't be killed. Otherwise, as they got him, just the way James was killed, they would have probably just killed him immediately. But he cannot be killed during the feast. So, they lock him up. Praise God. Alright, so, having enjoyed the response of the Jews to his killing of James. Herod Agrippa I didn't want to take chances that Peter 
who was under arrest could possibly escape while the feast was on. He very much looked forward to the greater adulation that would be his if, after the festive season, he brings out Peter and slays him. So he was looking forward to it. And he wanted to make sure that this guy does not escape during the feast. So he, he was looking forward. Ah, if these people celebrated when I killed James and they hailed me, they were happy with me. Can you imagine how they would dance and celebrate me when I eventually kill Peter? Because Peter was seen as a bigger fish. He was seen as a bigger fish, a bigger leader. They will probably throw a carnival on the street to celebrate me. So the guy was looking forward to that. That was his objective for these things. So Acts chapter 12. So hence you find in Acts chapter 12 verse 4. He said after arresting him, he put him in prison. Handing him over to be guarded by four squads of four soldiers each. So there were four squads. Of four soldiers each. So each swore is each squad rather had four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring him out for public trial after the Passover. So that was his plan. Now the Jews usually they split the night, 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. into four watches. Of three hours each. Yeah? Four watches. Remember now, you have four squads of four soldiers each. So each squad had four soldiers. So a, a total of 16 soldiers. Yeah? So these Jews, what they usually do, they split the night uh, from 6 p.m. in the evening to 6 a.m. the following morning into four watches of three hours each. And for each watch, Agrippa ordered that, you know, Peter be guarded by a squad. So in essence, he's saying that there should be four soldiers on shift to guard Peter for three hours each. For each watch. A watch is referred to as three hours. So the soldiers were to run a shift yeah, of three hours each. Each squad. So to guard to be guarded by a squad of soldiers. John chapter 19 verse 23 confirms each squad actually had four soldiers. As also translated, you know, here by NIV and the Amplifier. When you check the, the scripture in Amplifier, you will find that there. So meaning, four well-armed soldiers had to keep watch on Peter while he was in prison. Round the clock. Three hours. At a time with his squad doing six hours a day. King Herod Agrippa I certainly didn't want to take chances that Peter might escape. So in other words, invariably what we are saying in simple term is that you have four squads. Each squad had four soldiers each. Yeah? But in each of those squads... Each of those squads run two shifts. So a shift was designed. Each squad run two shifts a day. So let's say I am in, um, let's call it squad one. Maybe my shift is 6 p.m. in the evening to 6 to 9 p.m. that evening. Then I will close and another squad will come and take over the shift. I go home. But I have to come back by 6 a.m. in the morning for my second shift. So each squad had two shifts in a day. Four squads, one squad does 6 p.m. to 9 p.m., another squad 9 p.m. to 12 midnight, another one 12 midnight to 3 a.m., another one 3 a.m. to 6 a.m., and then the first squad that did 6 p.m. will come back to do 6 a.m. to 9 a.m. That was how they were guarding him daily. I hope you get that now. Alright, let's look. So, this was what Herod did. Because we're looking at what did Agrippa do? Herod Agrippa 1 do 
to ensure that Peter does not escape from prison during the feast. This is exactly what he did. I don't know who the enemy has put to guard you, to lock you, to, and they have put monitoring spirit. Because all those, all those squads, they are like monitoring spirit, familiar spirit. Monitoring to keep you in hardship. Monitoring to keep you down. Monitoring to keep you locked down. I command the fire of God to locate them and consume them now. In the name of Jesus Christ, every evil soldiers on assignment around your life, they catch fire today. You receive that, let me hear your amen. All right, we look at subhead number three. The option that was chosen by the early church in response to these very worrying events. So we have seen why Herod Agrippa won was doing what he was doing. We have seen why he targeted the top people in the church. We have seen what he has done when he picked up Peter and what he has done to ensure that the guy does not escape, that he's, been able, he's able to keep him until after the feast to come and kill him. So how did the early church respond to this very worrying event? Because, I mean, who knows where Agrippa will stop is done with James. Now they pick Peter. After Peter, who is the next? So how did the church respond? How did the early church, when the brethren saw this negative trend, how did they respond? How did they respond? That's what we'll be looking at now in subhead number three. Now, today, you'll agree with me that people might use smartphones and social media to get the news around fast. You know, just say, hey, do you know Peter has been arrested? Though? The same guy who killed James have already arrested Peter. Some people will go and do Facebook Live. Some people will just post an image. Some people will just say, uh, you know, rest in peace. Some people will just say, you know, uh, uh, breaking news. Social media would have. But some people may do that. But also, they may even consider organizing some protest. People may go on protests on the street, especially in civilized countries. Maybe a place like the UK, uh, and uh, you know, may, may go on protests on the street. But if it's a place like uh, some other countries, let me not mention them, they may be afraid to go on protest because soldiers may be released to come and shoot them in their peaceful protest. So they may even consider organizing protests, whether peaceful or violent. Of course. The early church, they knew that they dare not protest in their situation as that would have given the authorities, Agrippa and the government, the justification for a mass and deadly attack on the protest. The guy was already angry with them. He, he was a, a totalitarian. You now go out to protest. Ah, he said, these people have been trying to kill. They have played into our hand. So they would have just massacred them without sparing all the other believers that were associated with them. So they knew that mm, we cannot go out on a protest. So what do we do? Now, armed rebellion was out of the question. They also knew that armed rebellion was out of the question because they would have been outgunned by the soldiers. If they go and carry guns, so let's go and fight. The soldiers of Agrippa would have finished them. So they knew that that was not an option. It is quite possible that some of the believers might have considered taking early cover. Basically running into hiding. Running away and watch developments from a safe distance. It's possible. Some of them would have thought about that. Sir. The way this thing is going, let's run for our life now and take early cover. So that we are not caught up in this thing. So all of this would have been going through their mind. But rather than pursue any of the above options that I've just mentioned. Let's see what they did. The believers chose to go into prayer warfare. Wow. Instead of saying let's go and protest. Or let's go and occupy social media. Or let's, let's run into hiding. Let it be, it's only two people that died, uh, not all of us. 
No, they decided to engage prayer warfare. As chapter 12, verse 5, the Bible says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. Earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. And this should give us joy. We thank God that the early church clearly teach us from their example that though we walk in the flesh, <laughs> though we walk in the flesh, as mortal men, we are not to carry on our spiritual warfare according to the flesh and using the weapons of man. The weapons of our warfare are not physical. They are not physical weapons. They are not weapons of flesh and blood. Our weapons are divinely powerful for the destruction of what? Fortresses. Somebody said uh, that you know, another option, if it was in our day, is to sign a petition, which is true. You know, a petition circulate to sign. But they dare not do that because they sign the petition. Who is the petition going to? It's going to the authorities, the authorities that are persecuting them. So they, they had no option. But, you know, going to riding, no. So what did they do? They went into the place of prayer. They, 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 they knew, as the scripture says from 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 2 to 4, that their weapons were not carnal. They were mighty through God. So they knew that this was not a battle you can fight in the flesh. There are many of us who are under the sound of my voice. There are battles you are trying to fight in the flesh. You cannot win them in the flesh. They are won in the spirit. Preaching on Sunday, I said that exchanges are taking place regularly, daily in the spirit realm. That's when where you win your battles. That's where life and destiny is, is, is determined. I pray that somebody here, you will know where to fight your battle from. In the name of Jesus Christ. So these weapons, what are these weapons? That the Bible says are not kind and mighty. They are listed in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 6. And the scripture says in 2 Corinthians 6, it says, By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. So we can see our weapons there as believers. What are our weapons? Purity is a weapon. Knowledge is a weapon. Patience is a weapon. Kindness. This does not sound like uh, the AK-47 you are used to. But these are powerful weapons. The Holy Spirit is a weapon. Genuine love is a weapon. Truthful speech. Speaking the truth is a weapon. Truthful speech. The power of God is a weapon. He said with righteousness also, is a weapon. It's a weapon. For the right hand and also for the left hand. Also in Ephesians chapter 6, reading from verse 11 to 18. The Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. He said, therefore, take up the whole armor of God. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore. Having fasting on. Now it's listing them. Fasting on the belt of truth. Again you are hearing the truth. Truth is a weapon. Stop living a life of lies or telling lies. There are so many people who are. They are competing with the devil in life. In the lying uh, journey. It's like they are in a competition. The, you know the Bible says that the devil is the father of all lies. He's a liar from the beginning. There are human beings who are, it's like they are living their life in competition with the devil for telling lies. May that not be you. May you not fall into the hands of such people. In the name of Jesus Christ. He says, standing, stand therefore, having fasting on, 
the belt of truth, which is one of your weapons. So truth there is a weapon. And having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Again, we are hearing there that righteousness is also a weapon. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. We are seeing there that peace also, the gospel and peace is also a weapon. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith. We are saying there that faith is also a weapon with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one and take the helmet of salvation. We see that salvation is a weapon and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. The word of God also is a weapon. Verse 18, he said, praying at all times in the spirit. We see in there again, the Holy Spirit is a weapon with all prayer. So prayer also is a weapon and supplication. Supplication is a weapon. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the same. So they understood that they cannot fight this battle with human weapons. They must use spiritual weapons. And these are, these are weapons are just listed. They are unusual weapons. They are weapons that the world may not associate strength with, but they are powerful. The Bible says they are mighty true God. Purity is a mighty weapon. Righteousness, a mighty weapon. Faith, a mighty weapon, true God. Uh, 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 truth. Truth, a mighty weapon through God. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit, a mighty weapon through God. Patience and kindness, genuine love, mighty weapon through God. So they believe a prayer, a mighty. So they decide to take on the weapon of prayer. Let us fight this battle with our weapon of prayer. We go into this warfare in prayer. Not in protest, not in signing petition, and not in carrying physical gun. So that's exactly what they did. So the early church clearly teach us that when we are faced with severe challenges by the evil one and his agent, we should utilize our spiritual weapons. Of what? Of prayer and supplication. When you are faced with challenges, from the evil one, utilize your spiritual weapons of prayer and supplication. Backed up with what? With faith in the lost power to do the humanly impossible. And I'm telling you, we are seeing the evidence of that. Those of you who have been joining us every morning, 6 a.m. for the Zion Prevail Prayer, you, can, you, you are seeing the evidence. I mean, daily. Can you imagine daily there are testimonies as I was driving to the church this evening for this, for this service, you know, when I took off uh, uh, from home uh, someone who has been trying to call me uh, all of today, I said, okay, I'll make uh, I, I, would, I would call them so I called, I returned their call as I left the house driving towards church in fact, they were on the phone with me from when I left the house till I got to the car park in church, they were, but they were just sharing with me testimony. I knew that they had a, 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 some, a situation in their life that were praying for, they were, they'd be joining the on, online prayer every month. It, in fact, I was saying, wow, wow, because it was catalog of testimony from one to the other. They say, pastor, it's not finished you, and then another one. It's not finished you, and then another one, and, and then another one. Amazing, amazing. Amazing. And they were saying to me, Pastor, you don't know the impact you have been making in our lives. You know, we are far, but we're joining online that through this period, especially the impact, the change, the miracle. I I'm telling you, amazing. I'll be sharing some of the testimony on the Anzal Prevail uh, uh, platform. So you we recognize that when we engage those weapons of prayer and supplication. The things that are human impossible are made possible. So we should walk in patience, righteousness, and genuine love instead of dwelling on how to harm the devil's agent. Rather, rather uh, shut 
our mouth, because of the fear of the enemy, we should be ever ready to share the gospel of peace at such times as the Lord gives us the opportunity. So basically, what was the early church response? They responded by using spiritual weapons in the, uh, uh, by going in to fight this through prayer. Prayer warfare and supplication and faith, believing that something will happen. I pray for somebody who is weak in the spirit, whose spiritual weapons seem weak. You check your life, your righteousness and purity is weak. You, your prayer life is weak. Your faith in this season, especially in this season, is weak. You look at it, you say, Pastor, my, the spiritual weapon, your patience level is weak. Kindness and love, weak. I pray that the Lord will strengthen your spiritual weapons. And as you engage them, victory is delivered to you in Jesus' precious name. And somebody say, Amen and Amen. All right. We look at the last subhead for tonight. What the experience subhead for? What the experiences of James and Peter remind us of? What does their experience? Remember, James was killed. Peter was picked up in prison. What does their experience remind us of? And our need to persevere to the end. What does their experience remind us of? And our need to persevere to the end. We we'll look at this under A and B. So, on under A, what these experiences of James and Peter remind us of? We are going to. What does their experience remind us of? Yeah, uh, I've kind of numbered them so that we, it's easy to grasp. Uh, so, I've called this. You call it now. Uh, I've numbered number them in um, Roman numerals. So, one on that subhead number four. Long before these events took place, the event, what happened to James, which we just known, he was killed, and then Peter arrested. But say, long before these events took place, the Lord alerted his disciples, including Peter and James, as follows. God, Jesus gave them, you know, alerted them in Luke chapter 9, verse 22, saying, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priest and scribes, and be killed, and on the third day be raised. So, we know that the disciples didn't want to hear this, or understand all the gloom and doom that Jesus was speaking of concerning himself, as you can see from Matthew chapter 16. As a fact, when you read that, you know, Peter, at a time, Peter was even challenging Jesus, no, and to stop him, they didn't want to understand that, but Jesus was putting them in the know. In the know of those things. So to make matters worse, Jesus challenged them in Luke chapter, that same Luke chapter 9, verse 23. He said, and he was saying to them all, if anyone. So he just told them, oh, he, said this, he said the son of mine, he basically said to them, I will be picked up. I will be, uh, this will be done to me. I'll be rejected. I will be killed and I'll be buried. Then the next verse, he said, if anyone of you wishes to follow me as my disciple, he must deny himself. Basically, set aside selfish interest and take up his cross daily, expressing a willingness to endure whatever may come. That's what he was saying to them. That you must show willingness. This is what I'm going to suffer. You may suffer as well, so, but you must show willingness to endure whatever may come and follow me. Believing in me, conforming to my example. And what is the example? The example that you will be killed. The example that you will be rejected. Huh? To my example, in living and if need be, suffering or perhaps dying because of faith in me. So Jesus was already preparing them. In verse 24, he said, For whoever wishes to save his life in this world, we eventually lose it through death. But whoever loses his life in this world for my sake, he is the one who will save it from the consequences of sin and separation from God. 
So Jesus, long before this time, the disciples were already being prepared. As you can see there, Jesus was already preparing them. That this gospel, this Christianity is not just bread and butter. It's not just what bread and butter. There is suffering no associated with it. This is what I'm going to suffer. Anyone who is going to follow me, well, you must take up your cross. You must deny yourself and be ready to walk through any path. That's why, you know, when you see people say, well, things are not going well. So I say, let me take a little break from this Christianity. No, we serve God in, in, in joy and also in our pain. In our season of pain, we serve him. In, in our season of joy, we serve him. Our commitment and faithfulness to God does not diminish because of the situations of what we are going through. That's what Jesus was trying to prepare them for. In, in Matthew chapter 20, verse 20 to 23, what the Lord said to James and his brother John when their mom came to ask for reserve seats. You remember when their mother said, oh please, can you permit that my son on that day in the kingdom, one will sit on your right and the other one on the, on the left. Yeah? To ask for a reserve seat in heaven for the two of them yeah, was what James now experienced. Because, you know, when the mother asked for that, Jesus said, well, to, to give that permission, who will sit on my right and left? It's not in my uh, uh, power to give. But, we'll read what he said there. Now, we say that in Acts chapter 12 verse 2, that is exactly what James suffered. Why? Because as you see Matthew chapter 20 verse 23, he said to them, this is what Jesus said. He said, you will drink my cup. What is the cup? You will die the, the death. You will, you, you, so he said, you will drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. And that's exactly what happened to James. So their mind, Jesus was already preparing their mind. It's not in my position to tell who will sit on my right or who will sit on my left. But be prepared that whatever comes with this gospel, I'm not backing at. There are people who have withdrawn from Christianity because they feel, well, I didn't get this. This didn't work for me. I prayed this prayer. I, 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 I did this. I sowed this seed. And this did and they, they back at. No, no, no. We don't pull back from our commitment. We don't pull back from what we are supposed to be doing. We keep doing it. Whether it delivers good or it does not deliver. That's what Jesus was saying to them, preparing their mind. Thirdly, the letter to the Hebrews remind us the experiences of the believers in the early church were really no different from those of the Old Testament prophets and men of God who equally suffered the long list of acts of persecution which is stated in Hebrews chapter 11. When you look at Hebrews 11 verse 36, people have suffered for this gospel, so you will not be the first. He said, others suffered what? Mocking. And what? And flogging. And even chains and what? Imprisonment. They were stoned. They were sawn in two. So they used saw, saw to, to cut some into two. They were killed with the sword. Some were killed with the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats. Destitute. Some became destitute for the sake of the gospel. Afflicted for the sake of the gospel. Some mat mistreated for the sake of the gospel. Of whom the word was not worthy. Wandering about in desert. Some of them wandering about in desert and in mountains. And in dens and caves of the earth. So can you see that? So, people have suffered. So, Jesus was preparing their mind. Look, you know, so what Peter went through, what James went through, reminds us of all these things. That, look, Christianity is not just a, it's not just bed of roses. There are times when, if necessary, people have suffered and have been maltreated, have been mistreated. So that's why somebody comes to church. He said, the way that person spoke to me, I won't go to that church again. You are not ready. It's just talk. Somebody talk to you. Your faithfulness. No, no, I can't serve in that choir again because of the way this person spoke to me. They have not, they have not put knife on your neck. You are already withdrawn for choir. And the way he looked at me. How can he look at me that way? 
So the kind of Christianity, some, can you imagine you are going to go to the same heaven with these people who went through this? They went to say, why did you not, why did you stop singing in the choir? He said, eh, the other day when I went to practice, eh, this person, the way they spoke to me, I didn't like it, so I just withdrew. Huh? The, the, can you imagine James will be looking at you and say, ah, you withdrew because somebody spoke to you. Do you know what? I was killed. I, 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 I was killed. Have you not heard of John? John was put in a hot pot of oil. He didn't withdraw. May God strengthen our faith. May God strengthen our faith. So Paul would himself also record many tough experiences. We know even Paul's life. We'll study them later more in art. Tough experiences in his life as a minister of the gospel. You will see the list in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 16 to 28. And if you take note particularly of 23 to 28. Can we just look at that? 23 to 28, 2 Corinthians 11. You see what Paul himself went through for the sake of this gospel. 2 Corinthians 23. He said, are, are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors, more abundant. He labored what? In stripes. He said in strife above measure. I had more strife than many. In prisons more frequently. I was in and out of prison for the gospel. In death often. I was at points of death many times. From the Jews five times I received 40 stripes minus one. So it was flogged 39 times. Five times at different occasions. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep. Are you seeing that? He said, in journeys often, I was in journeys often, I, in perils of water, in perils of robbers. So I fell into robbers for the sake of this gospel. I fell in, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren. Are you seeing that? In weariness and toil, sleeplessness often. In hunger, he has been hungry because of this gospel. In test, in fasting, in cold, in nakedness, be made naked because of this gospel. Beside the other things, he said there are other things so I cannot even mention now. What comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. What have you suffered? What's your list? You write your list, let us see. Somebody did not greet me. Somebody, they did not telephone me. Hey, I was having a headache and nobody called me. Look at the list of a man. For this same gospel. May we be strong believers. May nothing be too difficult. That makes us lose our faith. In Jesus precious name. Amen. Somebody say Lord help me. Oh I can hear you now. Say Lord help me. So no suffering for the sake of the Lord. No suffering for the sake of the Lord. Isn't reserved for some unlucky believers. So suffering is not reserved for some believers. Some, uh, well, that one is reserved for some unlucky believers. No, no, no. If we are true and faithful followers of him, there will be trouble of one type or the other for us. And it's important that we know as believers. It could be peer pressure. It could be peer pressure to conform. Or they are rejecting us. People may reject us for the sake of the gospel. Say, well, eh, I don't want to run my Christianity in a way that you know, I just lose all my friends. My dear, if running your Christianity to please God makes you lose your friend, that is a small price to pay. It's a small price to pay. You don't have to fit in, conforming to the word. What Christianity, you must give up something. Suffer something for the sake of the gospel. So, you know, it could be peer pressure to confirm or they are rejecting us because we don't fit in. Expropriation uh, uh, of church property as is happening in China where the government takes over church properties. It happens. Imprisonment as in many countries these days. There are countries where people are locked up because of the gospel. Kidnapping taking place. Sex enslavement. Like we know of the is it Chibok girls in Nigeria that were picked up. And we, we, we heard of, uh, I think, another group that they released many of the girls. The, what, one girl they called, is it Shaibu? Uh, Shwaibu refused to be released because she refused to deny the gospel of Jesus. An execution 
as in the hands of Nigerians, Boko Haram, and Hesme these days. So all these are prizes people are paying for the gospel. May the Lord help you to be strong in the place of the gospel. All right, B, the B part. Because we are looking at, uh, on that subject, what the experiences of James and Peter remind us of, which is what we have just looked at now. So we are now looking at the B part, our need to persevere to the end. B, the above reality that we have just looked at raises the legitimate question. Why continue as a believer in the Lord, given all these troubles that go with it? Why should I continue, Pastor, as a believer, given that there's all these troubles? It's not better that I not just be, do not just live as a believer. Look at the trouble associated with it. Well, I'll give you four points quickly. Number one, Paul reminds us that the unpleasant and sometimes horrible situations we may face are not the end of the story. They are actually passing and momentary. So the suffering is not the end. He said, but there is very pleasant light at the end of the tunnel. For example, when you read 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul writing, he said, for our momentary light distress. In other words, the pass momentary means it's passing. It's not the, that's why some people quit at the face of trouble that is passing. Momentary light distress. This passing trouble, he said, is producing for us an eternal weight of glory. A fullness beyond all measure, surpassing all comparison and transcendent splendor and an endless blessing. you find that, you know, in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, if you read, you know, verse 16 to 18. So, we don't give up because we know that the persecution is momentary. It's not permanent. Number two, again, the Lord did not hide nor coat the coming difficulty with honey. We, we're already aware. We're already aware. So, you know, a stone that you see before it gets to your eyes cannot blind your eyes. He was direct when he said, in Matthew chapter 10, Jesus was speaking. I've already pre us. He said, brother will deliver brother over to death. And the father, his child. And children will rise against parents and have them put to death. He said, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake. So why are you worried? You already told. He said, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. The Lord challenges us to endure to the end, to persevere to the end. Because only those who do so will be saved. They are the ones that will be crowned. And the ones that will receive reward. So we are already pre-warned, pre-prepared. Do you understand? Jesus has told us, he said you will be rejected. Sometimes your Christianity will make your family reject you. Give up on you. Turn against you. People will hate you. He said, but don't let that worry you. Don't let that worry you. You know, you are not seeking the love of men. You are seeking the love of God. The Lord help us in Jesus' name. Number three, as a challenge to us, we should remember that though the Old Testament prophets that suffered so much did not see and experience the new covenant and the blessings that come with knowing the Lord Jesus, they still persevere to the end. Are you seeing that? So those guys we listed in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 39 to 40, where they say some were beaten with stroke, some in peril, some in this, some in... They did not have an encounter with the New Testament, with Jesus, with the experience of Jesus. But you, you do. So that's your encounter. If they could go through that, even without meet encountering Jesus, what about us? So God the Father chose the timing of Jesus' first coming. And we today are the beneficiaries of what Moses, the Isaiah's, the likes of Jeremiah's, Ezekiel's, Daniel's, and all the many other prophets prophesied despite the mockery, rejection, suffering, and even death they faced as a result of their ministry. So, you know, they didn't see these times, but they stayed fast. So we also can succeed in it. Final point on that. Why should you continue even in the face of suffering? Those who persevere to the end will not only be rewarded by the Lord, as you see in Revelation chapter 2, verse 26 to 28, but he will in fact own us. If you persevere to the end, 
Jesus will own you before the Father. You see that in Revelation 3 verse 5. He said, he who overcomes the world through believing that Jesus is the Son of God will accordingly be dressed in white clothing. And I will never blot out his name from the book of life. And I will confess and openly acknowledge his name before my father and before his angels. Saying that he is one of mine. So Jesus will introduce you to the father as one of his. Because he will own you. Say, Father, this one is my own. No. This one is, you know, as you introduce, it's, ah, this is my best friend. We've come a long way. This is my personal person. That's what Jesus will be telling Father. This Moses is my personal person. This Aisha is my personal person. That's what Jesus, won't you love that? For Jesus to be introducing you to God the Father as his personal person. So that's why when we go through sufferings for him, we should not give up. May this confession be true of you and me. What is the confession? But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed. But to those who have faith and are saved. So no matter what we face, we are not one of those that withdraw from the faith or withdraw from the gospel. May the Lord strengthen you to stand fast in the gospel. In Jesus' precious name. And everybody say a man. Have you been blessed by that lesson? I think it's very insightful. All right, we go to our discussion questions. Now, we have four of them, although number four is broken down into 4A and 4B. So, number one, why was King Herod Agrippa I up and against the early church with focus on the top men? Why was Agrippa up against the early church? With a focus against the top men. Question number one. Oh, hallelujah. All right. So, who is sending? You can send in on uh, YouTube and also on Facebook. Why was King Herod Agrippa I up and against the early church? With focus on the top men of the church. Great is our God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. All right. So from John, Yanguba said, because he wanted to be worshipped. That's true. The guy wanted to be worshipped. So he felt that God was uh, his rival. In being worshipped. So yes, that, that's why he was a, against the early church. Why was he focused on the top men? Anyone? All right, Grace Darwish said, because of the gospel and the God behind it, he sees the top men as rival and danger to his interest. All right, he, 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 because of the gospel and the God behind it, yes, that's why he rose against the early church. But he wasn't seeing the top men as his rival. He was seeing God and the gospel as his rival and danger to his interest. Yeah? So that's what he was seeing as his interest. Uh, the Atara star said uh, he saw God as a rival to him. Yes? He thought if he could get rid of the leaders of the church, if he could get rid of the leaders of the church, the church would scatter. That's true. So he felt, you know, let me target the heads. Obed said because he sees them, as a danger to his interest. So he was against the early church because he saw the church and what they represent as a danger to his interest. Lee said his hatred for gospel and the God behind the gospel. He believed killing the leaders will position him to be worshipped. Yeah, he, he believed killing the leaders will end the church. And obviously that would take the God rivalry out of it. He felt he, he God was his competition, basically. And so, how does he destroy the church? If he kills the top men, the people that are falling will scatter and uh, there will no longer be church. So, everybody's focus will not be to worship him. All right, number two. How did he, now speaking of Agrippa, ensure that Peter couldn't escape during the Passover week? How did he ensure that Peter could not escape during the Passover week? Answers? Answers? 
how did he ensure that Peter couldn't escape during the Passover week? All right, the Atara star said he had four guards have a shift of three hours twice, okay? That would be twice daily. That's good. So he had four guards, which are, uh, so four uh, squads, yeah? Half shifts of, uh, and each squad, we said, have four soldiers. Lee Zajimole said he was guarded with well-armed soldiers round the clock. Yeah, he was guarded with well-armed soldiers round the clock. And we broke it down to the shift pattern that they were running. And there were four soldiers in each shift. Okay. Um, so those, are the, those answers are correct. We go to number three. Number three, what option? Did the early church choose in responding to these very worrying events? And why did they choose that option? All right, so number two, Brother Godson has said, Herod Agrippa, Agrippa one, had four squad of four soldiers to guard Peter. Each squad guarded Peter for three hours per shift. That's correct. That is correct. Uh, Grace Darwish uh, answered to number two. He put him in prison with well-guided soldiers. That's correct. Uh, Obed Okolo said he divided the soldiers into four guards to guard him. Yeah. So basically, there were four squads which had four soldiers in each. And the, each squad was working three hours shift uh, twice daily, as Atara Star said uh, before. Okay. Number three. Number three. What option did the early church choose in responding to these very worrying events and why? Liz Ejimole said they engaged in prayer warfare, a spiritual weapon. That's correct. And why? Why did they choose that option? Uh, Mamunoram said soldiers run four hours shift. No, they ran three hours shift. Yeah? So there were a total of uh, eight shifts. Four shift, four night shift, and four day shift. Okay, uh, so we in number three, grace that we said they chose to go into prayer warfare. That's true. Uh, John uh, Yanguba said the weapon of prayer. So they chose to use the weapon of prayer. They chose to use the weapon of prayer. Why did they choose that weapon? Why do you think they chose that option instead of all the other options that we were? thinking, you know, they could have chosen. Brother Obe said they engage in spiritual warfare, which is true. Anybody wants to just throw a light on why you think they chose that option? Just before we go to number four. All right, whilst you are giving that reason, let's put number four up so that others can be reading it. The Atalas has said they prayed or battled in the spirit, Okay. They knew that prayer was a powerful weapon. That's true. So they chose that weapon. They knew that prayer was a powerful weapon. Uh, all the other option could have actually, you know, led to their death if they came out to protest or to fight with the soldiers. That would have just played, made them play into the hands of uh, King Herod. All right, number four A. Four A. What? Do the experiences of James and Peter remind us of? What does the experience of James and Peter, what does it remind us of? Number four, A. What does the experience of James and Peter remind us of? And then... Uh, 4B said, is there any point in continuing in the faith given all these troubles that go with it? So those are the last two questions. Anybody sending in their answers? Number three, uh, number 4A and number 4B. We're waiting on you. Okay. Uh, the Atara star said, they remind us to battle to the end. Well, yes, but I think it could be deeper. Uh, 
before a Lizzie Jimole said, their experiences not different from those of the Old Testament prophets and men of God. Christianity is not a bed of roses. Yeah. Basically, uh, their experiences remind us that Christianity is, that their experience is not different, yes, from that of the Old Testament, but also that Christianity is not a bed of roses. It comes with persecution. It comes with challenges. It comes with its own pains and, and all of that. Uh, grace that we said to persevere to the end because at the end, there is the light of God. Yeah, I think that that's like 4B, referring to 4B. Is there any point to continue to the end? Yes, it, we should continue to the end because at the end, the light of God shines through. God's son 4A said, the experience of the early church were really no different from the Old Testament prophet. That's true. That's true. Uh, but it reminds us also to know that even as Christians, there's the possibility that we may suffer some persecution. Uh, John Yanguba said that taking the gospel is not an easy task. It's true. That taking the gospel is not an easy task. It's true. Because there are a lot of things associated with it. Uh, Mark and Ellie said to persevere. So their experiences remind us to do what? To persevere. All right, so the, the last question, I want somebody, maybe one more answer on 4B. Is there any point in continuing in the faith, given that all these troubles, given all the troubles that go with it? I mean, we listed some that those who have served God before us uh, have gone through. You ask yourself, is there any point? I'm asking you now. Is there any point to continue to be a believer and to uh, continue in the faith, given all those troubles? What do you think? Yes, if you say yes, why? Um, Lisa Jimole said, troubles are not permanent. Yes, so that's one of the reasons we should continue because troubles are not permanent. Jesus has pre-warned us to persevere. That's true. Old Testament prophets showed us examples. That's true. Jesus will eventually own us. That's true. All encompassing. So yes, we should continue. The Atara Star said, Christ introduces you to the Lord as his friend or companion, which is true. At the end, you will be introduced as the main man for, of Jesus to the Father. The Lord bless us in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Will you put your hands on your chest and just say, Father, I receive grace to stay steadfast as a Christian in my faith no matter what I go through. Strengthen me not to lose my faith in the face of adversity. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, Tim as my said, yes, there is a point to continue in the faith. He said, you will always win in Christ Jesus. Obed Okolo said, yes, because at the end, Christ will see us as his and we will be saved. God bless you. Now we're going to take our tithes and offering. There are five ways in which you can give. There's the online giving. We, you have the link shared on the comment section. So you can just click that link and give. And also there is the direct banking where you can do a transfer. Uh, the bank details are there on the screen. PayPal is another option. You have the PayPal details there on the screen. And of course, telephone giving. 77 is the number to call this evening. And uh, in Africa, you have the Nigerian bank account details where you can give. Glory to God. Mami Noram said the challenges and persecutions are momentary. Yes, they are not permanent. They are a passing phase. I pray over every offering and every tithe that is released from your hand this evening. I pray God's blessings upon it. God blessings upon your life. To establish you in all your way. You will not lack good things. The favor of God flows freely for you. In Jesus precious name. Amen and amen. I bless every tithe that you are releasing from your hand. The blessing that follows a tighter rest upon you. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Praise God. Alright just to bring us a few notices before we share the grace. Tomorrow morning we continue with the Anzam Prevail Altar. Now remember that the church 
responded in prayer. Prayer is a spiritual weapon. So join us 6 a.m. in the morning and be one of the testifiers because your miracles will arrive. 6 a.m. in the morning. Make sure you are part of it tomorrow morning. And of course, uh, tomorrow evening, we have talk with the missus. It's going to be an exciting one. Actually, we'll be having a guest uh, joining us online for talk with the missus. Uh, a guest from the U.S. will be uh, joining us. We will be discussing the subject we, we started, I think, two weeks ago. Uh, we couldn't complete. We said we're going to continue. Why do some people struggle to marry? Why do some people struggle to marry? Struggle before they marry or struggle to marry? So we're going to be, it's going to be very interesting, both for married people and the unmarried. So make sure you join us 7 p.m. tomorrow. My wife and I are uh, also hosting a guest. So it'll be three of us on the platform tomorrow having this conversation as we link in our guest uh, who will be joining us from New York tomorrow. Uh, also, uh, before the throne, we'll be live 6.45 p.m. on Friday, so make sure you're part of it. And of course, on Sunday, 10 a.m., we have the service. Again, we're allowing a few people in, so if you haven't booked your seat, please book your seat if you want to be physically here. Uh, otherwise, every other person join in online. And uh, those of you who are looking to attend my mom's uh, service of song that we're hosting here next week, Friday the 26th, make sure you book the seat. I think there's a link to that which we shared on Sunday. We'll probably share it again this coming Sunday. Book your seat. Otherwise, every other person joining online. And there's an online platform where you can write your tributes as well uh, should you want to do that. The Lord bless you. The Lord establish his face and his grace upon your life. In Jesus' precious name, amen. I think uh, Sunday service, book your seat link is shared in the platform in which you are connected. So you want to be physically here, book your seat for Sunday service now. All right. I pray God's blessings upon you, God's grace upon you, and I pray that the strength to live strong as a believer continues upon your life. In Jesus' name, amen. Together we say, surely, God's goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives. We should dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. In Jesus' name, amen. Shalom, peace.